I thought I'd start with the situation where you are now, where you're a writer director, and I think you'd be reasonably comfortable in your choice of life and work. But are you? Does is there anything left to niggle at you? Um, do you think maybe you're not doing the quite the right job, or is there something that's missing? Uh, no, I mean, I, I would love to create a TV show. Oh, really? Love to do that, yeah. Um, I think, you know, there's a golden age of television going on right now, and uh, it's a, just a great place to work and get a good show. You know, people, you know, have all these ways to access shows now and, you know, catch up on episodes that they've missed them, and, uh, and people are being given the freedom to actually write great characters and great stories, so... Um, so that would be, that would be one thing I'd love to do. Okay. Um, but now, you know, as, as long as they, they keep letting me, you know, uh, tell stories, you know, whatever format it's in, you know, I'm writing a musical right now, stage musical, you know, I'm, I've written video games, uh, I'm writing an animated movie right now, you know, uh, anything, I, I don't really care about the, uh, you know, the format of it, mm -hmm. uh, as long as it's a good story with the good characters. So, and television is something I've, I've never done, and uh, I don't think there's been a better time to do it than now. So, yeah, that would oh. be cool. I guess, I mean, there's two parts of that question, two things that that brings up, which is, one, the hustle of the modern-day writer, screenwriter, if you will, mm -hmm. um, that's required to get... You've got all these different opportunities happening now, but that's obviously through, you know, chasing after it. Um, yeah. So, I mean, how much of your week is devoted to running up to the next thing? Um, gosh, it varies, you know. Um, right now, you know, I'm in a position now where a lot of things get submitted to me. Uh, a lot of books, a lot of scripts. Um, so it's more a matter of, yeah, you know, a couple of times a week, checking in with my agent and seeing what's out there. He'll call me and say, "Hey, I just got this. You know, does it interest you?" And I'll say, "Yeah, send it over." Or, uh, "No, it's not for me." Um, uh, you know, most of my week though is the day to day, just working. You know, whether it's finishing finishing Frankenstein or it's you know writing some new script. Uh, you know, but there there are different periods. You know, when you know. Uh, you really need that job or you want that job and you know if, if you know if, uh, you know I read a book that I love then I would work really hard to, to get the job of adapting it you know and uh, that then that would be a really heavy few weeks of, of uh, you know doing that but that's probably you know three or four times a year mm -hmm. two week periods and the rest is pretty much just doing the work I think okay all right so now I want to go back to uh, talking about wanting to write for television. And yeah. television is a writer's medium, uh, where the yeah. writers get to call the shots. You've been involved with extremely successful films, both um, you know, American and Australian, which is very, 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 very rare. Um, but at the same time, you've been raped by Hollywood committees time and time again. Now, I don't want you to put yourself out of a job, but if you could please... Tell somebody who wants to get into film making or screenwriting just how frustrating it can be to have a decent idea for a movie that's been knocked back by somebody who has no understanding of how a movie works. <laughs> on a scale of one to ten, you know, that's uh, <laughs> honestly, it's like now it's it used to be a ten, now it's like a six. Um, because I think I'm just much better at saying. To myself, that's fine. You don't get it. I don't want to work with you. I don't. I don't want to spend the next two years convincing you that what that you've made the right decision. You know, I want you to feel good about the decision right off the bat and work with me as a partner. You know, to get it made. So I, I usually, I, I'm fortunately in a position where you know if someone's not, you know, really excited by the idea, the script, or whatever it is, that I can kind of go. You know what? Let, let's not do it. You know, we'll find something else. You know. And that happens, and it happens to people you like and people that are good and people that know stuff and people that don't. You know, it happens with all kinds of things. So it, it's it's rare to find, you know, the thing that everyone's excited about in the same room, uh, and they're the ones that you tend to, you know, 
really fight for, you know, because, uh, like I say, it's a rare opportunity. So, um, so yeah, but when I was very frustrating, it's like, why can't you understand this? You know, and, uh, you know, it's just one of the, one of the things you learn that it's a subjective medium and everyone's going to have their own opinion and none of them are right and none of them are wrong. You know, it's just their opinion. And, uh, the trick is finding people that share your opinion, I guess. And, uh, and not getting so worked up about it when they don't. Well, ironically, uh, you're talking about the pre-production process, but also the post-production process when a film comes out and the internet gets hold of it, which is a, a modern phenomenon where people's opinions become... Um, I, it's almost like the ocean where the, the tide comes in and the tide goes out. Uh, right. I think something like I, Frankenstein um, is going to divide... Um, some people to start off with and then obviously some people are going to love it um, do you can you in some way shore up the possibility of success uh, in some way when it comes to a property like that or do you just go with your gut and hope for the best yeah I think all you can really do is tell a story that you find inspiring and interesting I, and that's, that's what I do to ensure that, if, if there is a way of doing it. I, I think trying to guess what people are going to like, I think it's a dangerous path. Um, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, so I, I really focus on saying, you know, I'm figuring out for myself what's a great story, you know. And, what, and you know, with Frankenstein, it's the idea that, okay, you've got this corpse that's being brought to is a monster, essentially. Everyone tells him he's a monster. And at the end of Mary Shelley's book, that's what he is. He's still a monster. Uh, so I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to take that monster and turn him, take him on a journey into becoming a man, you know, into that monster earning his humanity. And and, and that that is a central concept that I thought was a very strong idea uh, to take this famous monster and try and make him human, try and, and, and have him earn a soul so to speak, and um, I just found that interesting, and so then hanging everything off that, you hope that everything else is, you know, you pick things that interest you, gargoyles have always interested me, demons have always interested me, the, the conflict between the two has always interested me, so you know, put all that together, then I think you've got, you know, an interesting soup, it's certainly something I would go see, it looks, you know, it's, it's uh, I know Frankenstein, and I know, you know, he's such a great complex character, and, uh, and, you know, it's rare to have such a deep character uh, in an action movie, I think. You know, it's, you know, a character's always the first thing to get sacrificed. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why I took the job, because I felt that you couldn't sacrifice character in this case and still call it Frankenstein, because it wouldn't be Frankenstein anymore. Well, I mean, that's the interesting thing for people who are, um, I guess, ped pedantic about um, Frankenstein. It's Frankenstein's monster, and his original, in the original story, he's he's actually a lot more eloquent than his filmed versions. Um, and yeah. He has a lot more soul and a lot more interaction with his creator. It's a fascinating, I guess, um, unrequited love, um, yeah. which then deals with that. And I'm also interested in how you dealt... Uh, did you work at all with Kevin Grevio? Um, um, Kevin Grievous, no. 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 <laughs> Grievous, yeah. Um, yeah. No, no, look, um, Kevin had written... Um, a script, um, it was called I Frankenstein, it was a completely different story, mm -hmm. completely different characters, and when I came on, they said, we want you to start from scratch. Right. And uh, basically said, it's it's Frankenstein, Frankenstein's monster, modern day action film, we're calling it I Frankenstein. Right. What have you got? <laughs> and so, I just started from there, basically. Um, and, uh, and developed the story, developed the characters, developed the world. And then wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and, wrote and, uh, and when when we shot it. Okay, so um, it's obviously now you're at the position where um, you put it all to bed and it's kind of it's going to happen one way or the other. Um, do you ever have second thoughts after all that time, effort, and money that's been spent? You mean at the point of being greenlit or on set? Or? No, no, um, like literally at the completion of the film. Oh, like now? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, now, no, now. No, 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 no I don't. Um, because um, I have, I know I have worked as hard as I can possibly work. Mm -hmm. I've given it everything I've possibly got. 
um, I have, you know, uh, been able to harness, you know, some lots, lots of incredibly talented people who have given me everything they've got um, and put it all on, you know, you know, thousands of people really, you know, have helped shape the film and and have you know, put in all those hours. You know, everyone has worked so hard. I think everyone's done the best they could possibly do. And I believe in life that, you know, as long as you, you do your best at that time, that's the best you can do and there are no regrets. Right. So, um, so no, look, I'm very proud of the film. Uh, everyone really seems to like the film. And um, I'm excited to have it come out. Cool. Now, um, obviously, shooting in Australia, do you want to uh, present it in Australia? Do you want to come out and say, I'd hey, love to. Yeah. Uh, that's what I'm working on now. I'm working on the distributors in Australia to let us have a, a premiere down there, hopefully in Melbourne, where we shot the film. Oh, that'd um, be cool. So, yeah, so I'm really, really hoping that happens. Okay. So I'm pushing. But yeah. it's, it's a money thing, you know, I like everything. So, you know. <laughs> Will they make more money by having a premiere or not? It's, it's that, you know, age-old question. And all I can do is just, you know, shout and scream, which I'm happy to do. <laughs> well, it's, uh, I mean, it's fun. Yeah, you because know, it really is an Australian film, you know, and it's worked on, you know, all 99% is all Australian. And uh, it's a really great uh, showcase of, of what, you know, uh, we can do as a... A country of filmmakers, you know, we can really, you know, make big fun films, you know, uh, which is not something you usually associate with Australia. So, well, it's, I mean, you've been working a lot in in the states, but obviously you've come back and worked a couple of times in Australia um, with big budget films. Um, obviously, you're you're aware of um, the current, I don't know, crisis, in the sense that if an Australian film is released in a cinema, does anybody hear? Um, it's uh, remarkably disheartening in the local industry for people um, and I'm just wondering whether you had any thoughts um, as to how you could remedy the situation and make an Australian film on a halfway decent budget that actually hits people. Do you think it is all about the marketing dollar now rather than just the film? Uh, I think it's a huge part of it. I don't think it's just the film. Look, I, you think about a film like Kenny that was made on a shoestring, no stars, um, and, you know, it was a huge hit, you know, and I think that was, a lot of that was word of mouth, you know. Um, but it, that stuff kind of starts, uh, I think, with the film itself and the distributors seeing the film, and if they really love the film, they'll start to get behind it and get it out there, you know. I think you know, no film is successful without marketing to mm. some degree. You've got to get out there and this ever crazier, crowded marketplace, you've got to have people out there championing your product. But the film, you know, has to be a universal film. It has to be a commercial film, you know. I, I've i never seen commercialism as a dirty thing. I think it's, it's a wonderful thing, you know, to be able to make something to, that appeals to a lot of people. I think it's actually a lot harder than making something that appeals to just a few people. Um, and that means, you know, you've got to know who your, your primary cinema-going audience is, you know, and that's, you know, teens and 20-year-olds, you know, that over the movies and want to go to the movies and want to be entertained so you know we don't make many movies for that crowd in Australia and I think one of the reasons why Tomorrow was successful is because that was a film aimed at that crowd you know unapologetically so you know that's that was the point of it to, to make a film about teenage empowerment and I think that's why a lot of teenagers loved, loved the film you know I you know my cousin I remember she was you know, 20 I think at the time and I remember you know she was saying how much she loved the film and you know, she said, you know, it was funny, it was weird hearing Australian accents on screen. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, well, you know, you don't hear Australian accents. I'm like, well, of course you do. There are Australian films made all the time. She's like, oh, yeah, but we never see them, you know. Cause, and I was like, why don't you see Australian films? She's like, well, no, you know, there's nothing that interests me. You know, no films are being made for her, you know. So, I, I look, if anything, I would just say, you know, broaden the scope of what we're doing down there, you know, I think... Every, every country's film industry needs to have all different kinds of films being made to be a healthy industry. And I think right now we're kind of lopsided. Kind of lopsided into these kind of dark, bleak dramas. Um, you know, everyone's trying to be Animal Kingdom, and you can't be, you know. And so, and I, I, don't, I don't buy the line, well, you know, there's not enough money. 
I don't buy that at all because there are great, exciting universal films made on shoestring. There are great comedies made on shoestring, you know. So I just, I just think you know we we need to kind of balance out the scale, if you will, and make more films that appeal to more people, you know. And we can do it. We can absolutely do it. And you know, time and again, prove that we can. Now you've gone from. Um I guess a neophyte screenwriter in the 90s, uh, working very hard to get where you are. And I'm just wondering if you could talk about the process of becoming the guy who sends stuff to people to now the guy who gets stuff from people. I would imagine that obviously you have agents and producers sending you material, but you also have screenwriters sending you scripts and saying, hey, what do you think about this? Can you help me out here, buddy? Um, And it's kind of the beginning of a burgeoning empire. Um, (laughs) How does that feel? What does that what what goes through your mind? Do you feel like a benevolent, benevolent dictator, <laughs> or do you <laughs> no, feel like oh I, shit? I, I feel very appreciative for where I am. I, mean, I know I've worked as hard as I can possibly work to get here, and um, you know, the, there's certainly that that I, I, I you know I do I do I feel like I deserve it. I I, I deserve to be here just because all the hours that I've put in, the time, and, and all that stuff. You know, but I've hit every single run on the ladder, you know, I haven't skipped any anywhere, you know, and it's been, you know, a long, long process. So, uh, so I feel, you know, gratified to be here. I feel so appreciative to be here, uh, but I feel like I've earned it, I've earned, earned the place. So, um, what I try and do is just try and give back, you know, whenever anyone asks me, you know, advice, questions, you know, I, I, do whatever I can to, you know, talk people through it and help me and just share my story or whatever it is and, and do whatever I can to, to kind of give back because um, I, I feel very, you know, blessed to be to be in this position to be able to do that. So, um, yeah, look, it's a really good feeling. It's, it's a feeling that kind of, you know, affirms, you know, what you were hoped about yourself that you could do, you know, and... Uh, and says that you weren't crazy, and says that all that people, all those people that said you were crazy, were wrong. <laughs> and that's a good feeling too. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a great place to be. Although I think perhaps you're confusing. You've got a, a logic confusion there because you are crazy, but you've just been successful at it. Successful being crazy, sure. Yeah, yeah, probably. You know, you got to be a little bit crazy to to pull that off, <laughs> or to you know believe that you can do that. But, you know, it was really, for me, I, it was all I wanted to do, and I couldn't couldn't think of anything else that I, 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 I would want to do. So it was more like I'd better figure out a way to do this because I don't know what else I'm going to do otherwise. You know, and that, that was always a really good motivator. You know, it's like Cortez burning the ships. You know, there's no, there's no way off the shore. So figure out how to stay here, you know. Um, now, as a, I guess, uh, as a Hollywood insider inverted commas, um, I want to know if you've ever received a residual check from a major film corporation um, as part of a um, net profit participation, um, whether these things exist or whether it's still in the fantastical realms of things that will never happen. Yeah. No, net profit, no, you never get any of those. <laughs> but what you do get, you do get uh, really nice residual checks from uh, being a writer on a film or director on a film, you know, or an actor on a film, they're, they're you know, amazing uh, checks that you get from, you know, years and years and years later. I'm, I still get pirates checks, you know, I still get collateral checks. Um, one here the other day, I don't forget where it came from, but it was, you know, from some film I'd done, you know, and that stuff rolls in from all over the world, you know, and uh, and it's that, that's real money. You know, it's not net profits, you know, where you're just, you know, buying yachts. But it's it's real it's real money and, and uh, you know helps you through the tough times. Right. And so, you're not any worse. Okay, so yeah. you can actually make a living screenwriting. Oh god, okay, yeah, yeah. Mark Cherry was very uh, famously quoted as uh, saying that during his you know when he could not get a job for years, it was residuals of little episodes he had written here and there that kept him afloat before he came up with Desperate Housewives. You know, and it was. You know the residuals that kept them alive, and it's true. It's true. So it's it's a great thing that the writers guild does is to make sure you get paid those residuals. And, no, because yeah, it, that that does count. Yeah. Um, now, uh, I want to ask you a little bit about collateral. Um, obviously, so, you probably talked that to death. Um, but um, 
it's that moment when I guess um, you lost arbitration um, to um, pirates at the same day that Tom it's, came on board. So it's kind of like the evening gang uh, of Hollywood. Yeah. Um, where it kind of, yeah. But um, when a film takes that long to get made, is there something inside of you that says, oh, this was meant to be? Or is it just part of this eternal crapshoot where you just keep throwing shit at the wall and eventually it sticks? Yeah, hopefully it's not shit. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully it's decent. But, yeah, look, I mean, you can't control anything. And that's one of the first things you've got to learn. You cannot control it. That's why you've got to have all these balls in the air. Um, You know, that took, took, yes, there was a good three years of, of every director and every actor coming on, coming off, coming on, coming off. And, you know, if, if I was to look at that whole list of people uh, over those three years and pick the three that I would, you know, want most, it's probably the three that end up in the film, you know. So I, I would say it was a blessing in disguise. It also um, was a period where while the film wasn't getting made, the script was getting passed around town everywhere. So I was getting job offers all over the place. So that script was working for me. And by the time the film got made, it, 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 I remember feeling, well, you know, even if the film sucks, people will still know the film, the script was good, <laughs> and so I'll still get work. So it was kind of a, you know, a very safe place to be. Of course, it was, you know, a very gifted filmmaker making that film, so the odds were it was going to be good. Um, and he stuck to it, and he did. And uh, so it all worked out well. But, uh, but yeah, look, I, 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 uh, I kind of take it as, yeah, it was meant to be that way. You know, it did a lot for me both before it came out and after it came out. So, um, yeah, and that was an idea that, that, you know, I'd had since I was like 17. So it was a, you know, a great, and then again, another great affirmation that, you know, that was a good idea. <laughs> because it's not often that, I mean, uh, it's you and Seth Rogen really um, who have ideas as school children that kind of make it to the big time. And it's, <laughs> it's that persistence that separates the normal person from the obsessive compulsive. Um, because you, I, mean, I think something like 50 times that you rewrote the script. Um, yeah. Is that something where your sheer volume of output, of actual work, that separates you from your contemporaries who said, oh, I want to get into the movies and now aren't in the movies? Um, yeah, look, you know, I, nothing takes the place of persistence, you know, and determination and just not giving up. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I think that's something, you know, in any field, you know, that, that it's going to be a, a huge contributor to the likelihood of success. Um, and certainly that has been, for me, very true. Um, just uh, just never giving up and keeping at it, keeping at it, keeping at it, keeping at it, and, uh, and seeing it through. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say, you know, of, of, of all the things to, to practice, practice persistence. All right. Do you think you could make it as a screenwriter in Australia? Uh, now? Yep. Um, I think I could get work, yeah. Yeah, I think I could get work. Um, I wouldn't... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, like I said, I think I'd get work, but I, I don't know if I'd be artistically satisfied because um, the kinds of films that get funded and the amount of money that's there to be funded. Yeah, but my focus anyway is on you know writing and directing now. So it would be a matter of can I get those films made down there and the kinds of films I'd want to make, and and that would all depend on the subject matter, whether it was you need a lot of money or a little money or all that kind of stuff. But I, yeah, I think I could make a living um, down there if I wanted to. Um, but you know, this is this is my home now. This is uh, my family's here, my boys are here, school's here, you know, and uh, the kinds of jobs that I that I really like to take are all, all here. You know, it's a matter of walking into rooms here and, and taking those, those meetings. Now, um, I'd like to, before I let you go, uh, I'd like to take me into a pitch um, situation and I want to hear perhaps the craziest pitch that you've honestly tried to sell or perhaps the craziest um, note that you've been given in a pitch room. Like, you know, Romeo and Juliet would be great, but, you know, what if they're teenagers or something like that? I've been getting a lot of crazy notes. <laughs> oh, God. Well, I mean, even on Frankenstein, it was, 
absolutely, absolutely forbidden to put scars on Frankenstein. Absolutely, we're not putting scars on Frankenstein. And there was uh, there was even one actress who that she was up for because she was like, "But you can have scars, right? You can have scars on Frankenstein. It's Frankenstein." And she lost the job because the guy running the studio just you know kicked her out basically. Um, and that was a definite no. We were not going to have that. The, you know, of course we got you know huge scars on him in the film, but uh, yeah, there were all sorts of crazy notes, crazy pictures. Yeah, I know I put someone to sleep in a pitch once, you know, very early on. Really? Um, oh yeah, yeah. Well, I used to just you know write out the thing and then just read it. You know, head down reading for forty-five minutes. <laughs> you know, people start nodding off. Um, so I've learned to be better at pitches. I get really animated in pitches, actually. I really, you know, and I engage people and I, I say very little um, because I want them to ask questions. You know, I think that's that's the key to really, you know, to a successful pitch. Sorry, it's something I'm saying. Um, you know, you, you say as little as you can and get them off their seats and asking you about it and engaging and you have a conversation rather than you just that talking, you know, kind of thing. So, um, so uh, you know, that, that's what I've learned. It started off, my first pitches were just me talking, but now it's just, it's actually, it's more like, like, like you know, you've all just gone to see this great movie and you all talk for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and at the end they hire you to make it, you know. So that, that that's the vibe that I kind of kind of shoot nowadays. Um, I can't think of any crazy pitches. No. I can think of lots of crazy notes. Okay, well, tell me more crazy uh, notes because um, I just love that level that level of insanity that's involved with so much money, where people who are obviously living in some distant galaxy coming in and going, "Yep," um, because it's thrilling. Yeah, look, I think it's absolutely nuts to give anyone that amount of money to, to make something that, you know, that, on speculation, you know, that other people will come and see it. I think it's absolutely nuts, especially first-time directors. Where, you know, I remember on, uh, on Tomorrow, you know, on my first shot, just wondering what kind of director I was going to be and not knowing myself, you know, until that first week was done, really. And so if I don't know, how can you know? And how can you give me all this money, you know? <laughs> We could be here all week on one shot. <laughs> you don't know when you hire me, you know. So I, I, I think it's a, it's a huge gamble, and that's why you know, at the end of the day, I'm very, very appreciative for anyone who's willing to write that check, and uh, and I'll always be grateful to you know the people who do, um, because without that, <laughs> it's just all talk, you know. And yes, you have fights. Yes, you have battles. You have wars. That's the creative process, you know. And you, you just try and win more than you lose. Fair enough. Um, all right. Well, I'll let you go. Um, although I do want to know who else besides Russell Crowe was up for the um, the role of Vincent in Collateral. Um, oh, there were a lot of people. Exactly. A lot of people. Oh, I think back now. Uh, who else is up for that role? Oh, Ray Fiennes. Nice. I, I like that idea because he was English. And that just immediately said why he knew the cab driver is English. You know, he didn't know his way around, you know. Um, Rafe. Um, um, oh, God, I'm forgetting all these names. Uh, at one point, they wanted to make it into a Jack Black comedy. <laughs> that was scary. Um, no, they had, they, had, they had Adam Sandler. They had... Um, oh, God, there are so many combinations. I've forgotten them all. I mean, name an actor, they had them at some point. Will Smith was in there. Um, oh, jeez. I'll have to really think back on that one. I, I can't remember them all now. But it was always, you know, it was a different director, a different actor. It was always, they were always just, it was a turntable, you know? Wow. Uh, they could keep it, keep it straight, yeah. But Russell was the one who ended up getting Michael involved, and that's what kind of stopped the train. You know, at that point, you got, they got a, a director on that was absolutely committed to it and, uh, and that every actor wanted to work with. So that's what made that possible. Now, is that, is that process, um, obviously, it's a good script and people were looking at it for a while, for three years, you know, after the 15 years you were working on it. Um, is that something that happens on most of the things that you submit um, or most of the projects that you're involved with? Or is that just a rare example? 
Ah, uh, that's more rare. Um, you know, at that time, nobody knew who I was. I hadn't made any films. You know, I just uh, so so it was. Um, hey, look at this new writer, this new script. Right. I think you know, now it's more. You know, here's this is what he's. This is the latest thing he's done, basically. And you know, people either like it or they don't. But it's not as exciting, and so they don't pass around as much. But then I don't need it to be as passed around as much. So, um, so it's. Uh, yeah, I think you know, certainly for me in my career, that that was a one-off. Okay. Uh, I can't think of other scripts that I've written that have been passed around, but oh, Free Tender Humor was passed around a lot. I heard that they you know, all over the place. That one got passed around. Um, 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 <laughs> yeah, uh, just those two. Yeah. Ironically, Russell played the bad guy in that one. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason the reason I was brought on for that was because the director loved collateral and he wanted to have the you know kind of reverse collateral vibe, yep. you know, where the good guy had the guy and the bad guy. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was a fun one. Yeah. Um, and okay, one last question. Sorry, um, I have to know that. You have all these fantastical ideas that you've worked on and brought to fruition, but is there one uh, sci-fi idea that you've had locked away in your teenage brain that you think one day, when I'm at the Jim Cameron level, I'm just going to plonk it down and say, give me $200 million, <laughs> this is what I want to do? <laughs> uh, sci-fi... Mm. Uh, I've, I've got a few sci-fi ideas, yeah. No, but I, I'm look, I'm, uh, I'm about to do a, a sci-fi television show that uh, should satisfy that craving for a while. So, um, uh, as far as film, um, yeah. I mean, uh, the big one that I looked at was a big period, period, true story pirate film. Um, I think it's the most amazing story that I've ever come across, and that's. That's to me the big two hundred million dollar epic that sinks your career. You know that that, that one. Yes, that. So that's the one that I'm planning on. Uh, you know, unleashing. You know, however many years from now. That that's that to me would be, you know, the one that I, I would really 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 want to do. Uh, but it's a huge gamble. It's going to take a lot of money. It's boats on waters, period film. You know, three hour epic, action romance, but all true story, fantastic story. Um, so maybe maybe in you know ten years or so they'll, they'll let me <laughs> do that. I'll, get, I'll, you know, I'll convince someone to let me do that. So that that would be cool. All but right. the, yeah, I think that's that's what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I have a time to do that. Yeah. All right. Um, and you can't. I mean, obviously that stems from your research for pirates, um, mm. and you know more about pirates than every any human being on the planet. Uh, it wouldn't be a, a female Chinese pirate that you're talking about. Nope. You know, nope. Come across that story, great story. Yep. Uh, people ask me to write that story many times. Um, it's never worked out. I would love to write that story, but that's not it. No, oh, okay. Yeah. No. Um, and your sci fi television series, you can't tell me anything about that at all, could you? No, no, it's all top secret, but they'll, uh, they should be announcing it shortly. Look, Stuart, thank you so much for taking the time on a Friday afternoon. Um, Pleasure. I appreciate it, um, and I wish you all the best. Uh, you're obviously an inspiration to many Australian screenwriters here, um, and I guess we'll just, you know, it just obviously it's the hard work that uh, has put it in for you. Is there anything else besides the hard work um, that you can think of that has separated you from the pack? I mean, is there like... Uh, I, you know, I love it. I love it, love it, love it. It's not a chore for me. I know a lot of writers where it's a chore. Um, that works for them I absolutely love it and I think that's helped get me through um, a lot of rough patches a lot, a lot of you know, hard times it's the fact that I just you know I love waking up to, to write you know I always have and uh, watching it that way because I know it's not not everyone's like that so um, so I, I'd say that as well yeah that, that's a big big help Especially when you're writing through stuff you don't want to have to write. <laughs> writing those bad notes, you know. Uh, just, just, just love, love the process. Yeah, you know, love telling stories. You gotta love telling stories, you know. Uh, to survive, you know, all the the craziness that you go through to do it. You gotta really love it. I think you can't just be for the money or for the 
Bills or the celebrity or whatever. You know, it's, it's got to be it's got to be first and foremost uh, a love love story.